Hey everybody, I'm James and welcome back to Print and Play. In my last Raspberry Pi Pico video, I showed you three easy projects to help get you started on your Pico design journey. I thought that this time it would be cool to add some more hardware, in this case an OLED display and a potentiometer, and then try to code an entire video game to run right here on the Pi using just that hardware. Not only that, but I'm going to show you how to upload code to your Pi so that it'll run even if it's not connected to a computer. So if you're ready to get started, let's jump to the breadboard. So let's start off by wiring up our screen in the same way that they do in the diagram in the official example in the Pico Python SDK, which I will put right here. So let's start off by getting our ground, which will be pin three from the top left. And we'll go ahead and connect that to our ground line down here. So we'll have easy access to ground and power. Speaking of which, let's go ahead and get power, which comes from pin five from the top left and connect our power. Next, we'll connect power. So coming from the VDD pin, we'll go up to our power source and we can go ahead and connect ground, which is the pin directly next to it. And once again, just connecting up into our ground pins up here. Next, we'll wire up our SCK and that connects to GPIO 9, which happens to be 9 in from the bottom right. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. And then finally, we'll wire up our SDA, which goes into GP8, which is the pin to the left of the one we just connected. And with that, we should be able to begin our visual display test. So, with our Pico connected to our computer, running the MicroPython UF2 file we learned about in the previous video and connected to the Thani IDE, we can now go ahead and try and run the visual example provided in the SDK. So with our example loaded, we'll go ahead and click the play button, and we get a complaint about a missing module named SSD1306. And the reason for this is the visual example uses libraries that aren't installed on your Pi by default, but this is easy enough to remedy. So the first thing you'll do is go and download the file I've linked down below, assuming you don't have the MicroPython SDK installed on your computer. From there, we'll create a new file in Thani. We'll paste in the code from that file. And then we're going to do a file and save as. We'll be given the option to save to either this computer or the Pico, and we're going to save to the Pico. And then we'll name the file ssd1306.py. And with that, the library is now installed on the Pico, which means that when we go here and click play, we get the visual display coming out. Now, the original example calls for a screen that's 128 by 32, as you can see right here. I'm using a screen that's double that height. So the first thing we need to do is change the 32 to a 64. And this will allow us to use the resolution of the screen. As you can see, the text and image have shrunk in height by one half. So what does this give us the ability to do? Well, by changing an image into a byte array, we can change the image that's on the display and that's customizable. So we can see the image they used is 32 pixels by 32 pixels. We can then use the blit command to display that image on the screen at an X coordinate of 96 and a Y coordinate of zero. We can modify the text that they've put on the screen. So for example, if I change Raspberry Pi to print and play, and we change Pico to test and then rerun, the text changes from Raspberry Pi Pico to print and play test. What else can we do with this? Well, we can do an OLED.pixel and give it some coordinates. So let's say 25 by 25 comma one, and that will give us a pixel at 25 by 25 that is turned on and lit. We can use the rect command to put a rectangle on the screen. So we can do OLED.rect starting at 26 26, we can make a rectangle that is 25 by 25, and the final digit denotes the color. So we only have two colors, zero being black and one being white. If we then run this again, we get a rectangle on the screen. If we change rect to fill underscore rect and then run this again, we get a square that is completely filled in. We can also use the OLED.line command. And for this one, we provided a starting location. So let's say we start at one comma one, and we're gonna go to 10 comma 10 and color one and run again. 
and you see that we've gotten a line that's drawn at a 45 degree angle starting at 1 comma 1 and ending at 10 comma 10. And we can invert the color of the screen. So once our screen's completely drawn, we can do an OLED dot invert, set that to 1, and we now get the inversion on the screen. If we then set this back to 0 and run it again, we get the image as it originally was. So with all this ability to manipulate the screen, we should be able to toss together a pretty decent Space Invaders clone that'll run with this, but first we're going to need some more hardware. So the additional hardware we're going to be adding is a piezo speaker so we can get some sound effects. I'll go ahead and put this up at the top of the board with the positive terminal pointing up. And we're going to be using a potentiometer to control the location of the ship. I've decided to make it easier, we're just going to leave auto fire on so you won't have to push a button to fire, at least in version 1. So I'll go ahead and install our potentiometer here. Next we're going to need to power our components. So first we'll get power into the potentiometer, which in this orientation is the pin on the left. And we'll go ahead and connect that to our power here. Next we'll connect up our ground, which in this orientation is the pin on the right. And finally we'll connect up our signal, which as you might have guessed is the pin in the middle. And the signal wire for that connects to GP26, which is the 11th pin in from the top right. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. Finally, we can connect our speaker, which goes ground to ground. And the positive terminal to the fourth pin in from the top right. To demonstrate my Space Invaders game, I've gone ahead and rotated everything 90 degrees because I felt rotating things 90 degrees would give us the best use of screen space. So in the Thawney IDE, I'm going to go ahead and send my code across, and Pico Invaders comes up on the display. From here, we can then rotate the potentiometer from side to side to move the ship, and a shot fires every time the previous shot has cleared the screen, be that from hitting an alien, or from missing and going all the way off the top of the screen. Now, one of the questions I've been getting asked a lot is, what if you want your code to be permanent? Because right now, all the demonstrations I've done have required you to reload the code from Thawney every time you want to put something onto the Pi. Well, it's actually really simple to do. So from the Thawney IDE, you can go ahead and connect to your Pi. Then you can click File, click Save As on your source code, choose to save it to the Raspberry Pi Pico, and then call it main.py. Once that's stored, if you disconnect power from your Pi and reconnect power, your code will be executed automatically and you're ready to go. Now for most of the demo, I'm going to go ahead and remove the audio because I don't think that's going to be particularly pleasant to listen to while I'm trying to talk. And even if you're executing code directly from the Pico, you can still go into the Thawney IDE, click Stop Start Backend, and you're able to control the Pi remotely again. Then you can execute whatever code you want from here. And it doesn't overwrite what's already stored on the Pi, but it does run in its place until you disconnect and reconnect power to the Pi again. So let's step through some of the code and see what it's doing. The first thing we do is do our imports. So we're getting pin I2C, which is used to talk to the screen, the ADC, which is used to communicate with the potentiometer, and PWM, which we're using to create audio. We're also importing the screen definition, which is the SSD 1306 underscore I2C. And then we need sleep so we can add some timing to our stuff. And then we have the frame buffer, which is what allows us to put images on the screen and random for some random number generation. We then define the width and height of our screen, the pin that the potentiometer is connected to, and the same conversion factor we used for checking the temperature in the previous video. Next, we specify that the speaker is connected to pin 18 under pulse width modulation, and the Pico has two I2C lines, 0 and 1, and the screen is connected to I2C0. Using all the screen information that we've given, we can then define the OLED, which is going to be our variable name for communicating with the screen, and we give it the width, the height, and the I2C connection that we're using. 
I've built two game modes, one that's more visually impressive but takes up more of the screen and is therefore less challenging, and one that's lower resolution but gives a better gameplay experience. Right now we're running on low res, but if I set this to false and then rerun the code, you'll see that the size of the aliens on the screens changes and their animations gets a little more detailed. How do I do this? Well, I use the same variable names, but load in smaller byte arrays for the low resolution ones. Uh, and then I'm able to define the size of the X and Y on the sprites, the number of aliens we want to put on the screen so we can make this more or less difficult by increasing and decreasing these numbers and the spacing in between the aliens. So in this case, five pixels in between on the X and three on the Y. I also have byte arrays for the logo I designed, the ship, the UFO that goes across the top, and since text can only be displayed in the horizontal so far and not in the vertical, I went ahead and created number sprites that I would be able to use to display the score as well as the current level number. This is the aliens array and it'll be used to contain all of our aliens so that we can manipulate them with single lines of code. And that aliens array is populated with these alien objects. So each alien object is able to know whether or not it's currently visible, the type of alien it is, its X coordinates, its Y coordinates, and it also keeps track of its original X and Y coordinates to make it easier to reset them at the end of a level or at a game over. The define alien subroutine actually creates the aliens and adds them to our collection. And this is also where we define the image. So the first set of aliens, the first row in this case, gets the first alien image, but then the second ones get the second one and it passes back and forth. The reset alien subroutine is used to reset the X and Y locations of them and also optionally the visibility if you're going from the end of one level to another. Next we generate the frame buffer images so that we're able to display them on the screen for the aliens, the UFO, the logo, and I created a dictionary of numbers using the frame buffer so that all I have to do is say pass it the number zero and get the frame buffer back for number zero. This makes it really easy because then I can just store my score as an integer break it down as a string, and put it on the screen. At the beginning of the game, we fill the screen with black pixels to completely reset the image, then display the logo, and then do an OLED.show and pause for two seconds before beginning the game. Next, we have some variables that are used to track some basic information about the game. So add Y is used to track the speed and direction that the aliens move on each turn. Shot X and shot Y are used to track the actual location of the shot being fired from the ship. Loop count is meant to track the number of times we've gone through the endless loop that actually powers the game. Score, as you might guess, tracks your score. Difficulty is the current difficulty of the game. Show UFO is whether or not the UFO is currently on the screen. UFO Y is the Y location of that ship. And UFO count is the loop counter used to control movement of the UFO independently of the aliens and everything else. And finally, we have sound frequency, which is used to track the current audio frequency being played through the speaker. Then we kick off the whole thing by calling the define aliens function from before. Then we enter the loop. So the first thing we check is whether or not the UFO is currently visible. If it is, we're going to pulse back and forth between two sounds to create that nice high-pitched creepy UFO sound, and we turn the speaker on. And we have a couple of use cases where we turn off the sound. Next is where we determine whether or not the UFO is going to be displayed. So it's a 1 in 350 chance on any given loop that the UFO will be displayed if the UFO isn't already currently being displayed. So you can increase the odds of it showing up by lowering this number or decrease it by increasing here. Right now I've got it set to every time that random number generator generates 1, 2, 3, we're going to show the UFO and reset the UFO's location back to 0. Next, if the UFO is currently being shown, we can go ahead and move it across the screen, and if it gets above 64, meaning the right-hand limit of the screen, then it's no longer being shown. Now we increase our loop count by 1, and we fill the screen with 0 as we get ready to redraw things on the screen. So this checks to see if the aliens are about to be moved, which is if the loop counter gets above 16 minus the current difficulty. Well, if the UFO is not being displayed, meaning there shouldn't be any sound being played right now, we go ahead and put the audio out for the various alien movements, which is four separate sounds and turn the speaker on. Next, it's time to do some looping through our alien so we can do some processing on them. So the first thing we check is whether or not the alien is visible. If it is, then we want to update its animation frame. If the animation type is the first frame of the first type of alien animation, we switch it to the second frame. If it was already set to the second one, we switch it back to the first. Then we repeat the process for the second type of alien. Next, we want to check if this alien has reached the edge of the screen, either on the left or the right hand side. 
If it has reached the edge, we want to check to see whether or not dropping down again will bring it to the bottom of the screen. If it does, that's when the player would lose a life. We reset the alien positions back to their original starting locations, but we don't reset visibility since it's not the end of a level, and we set drop down to false. Otherwise, if this alien has reached the edge of the screen and it's safe to drop them down, we set drop down to true. Coming out of the loop, if drop down is set to true, then we're going to go ahead and reverse the directions of the aliens and then drop them each down by three pixels. Otherwise, we're just going to add on to their Y position like we normally would. Next, it's time to figure out where the ship should be placed on the screen. We read the value from the potentiometer, and then we multiply it by the conversion factor. We can then do some math based on the screen being 64 pixels wide, and use the value provided by the potentiometer to place the ship on the screen. And on each loop, we increase the shot X by 2. This moves the shot up the screen. Now we can check to see if the shot has hit the UFO. So if it's at the proper height and falls within the proper Y range, then we increase the score by 50, we set the visibility of the UFO to false, we reset the UFO's position to zero, and we reset the X and Y position of the shot itself. Next, we create a variable that will keep track of whether or not we found a visible alien while going through the loop. And the collision detection here works pretty much the same as it did with the UFO. Other than that, if the alien we're processing is currently visible, then we place it onto the screen for display. Next, we check to see if the shot has run off the screen, and if it has, we reset its X and Y position based on the position of the ship. If we go through all that and found visible is still false, well, it's time to increase the difficulty and level by one and reset all the aliens and their visibility. Finally, we display the ship and the shot on the screen, as well as going through and displaying the score and the current level. With all our visual elements processed, we then tell the screen to display them and do some final audio manipulation to get the proper sound effects and then we sleep for 0.001 of a second. By playing with some of the variables up near the top, we can increase or decrease the difficulty of the game. For example, if we wanted to only have two aliens on the X and two on the Y, we can switch the alien count X and alien count Y to two and two, and simply reconnect the Pi and send it across. And the game will load, but we only have two rows and two columns of aliens. If we wanted to increase that to six, we change them to six, click play again, And now we have a very full screen where the aliens drop down constantly. If we change this to 4 and to 4, but we change our spacing to 2 and 2, the aliens will be less numbersome and also closer together. So there's all sorts of manipulation you can do to get the game just the way you want it. Overall, I'm thrilled at the way my little game turned out. I think it's a great way to get started into programming something a little bit more complex on the Pico, and it was also a great way to challenge myself to make aliens that still look good but use as few pixels as possible in order to keep this game as playable as possible on a tiny screen. If you see anything in my code that could be done better, let me know. I'm always looking for ways to improve. Future additions will bring proper life counting, the ability for the aliens to shoot back, and the shields from the original game. What classic game would you like to see adapted for the Pico? Does this game give you an idea for a future project? Let me know in the comments below. That's it for this video, but keep those suggestions coming. Thanks for sticking around till the end, and until next time, stay creative.